All right, perfect. Everybody in, it looks like. Yes. Hey guys, it uh, looks like we have about uh, 38, 39 of you right now. So uh, I'm Connor, our director of customer success. Uh, likely have chatted with a, a fair bit of you guys, but we'll, we'll wait two to three minutes uh, in case we have any stragglers who are probably working on some deadlines that are due yesterday. Uh, so we'll we'll give them a few minutes to straggle in here. Uh, when you guys get the chance, go ahead and post in the chat your name, where you guys are from, what your title is, uh, and then send any questions as well throughout the day through that questions tab. That way we can we can make this a much more collaborative process. That's our goal here. Answer your guys' questions while also talking through this uh, this tributary with topic that Laurent's going to help us out with. So I'll, I'll go ahead and type in the chat just as an example here. Just so you guys see. And I am from, Addie's got it already. All right, we got Addie, we got Laurent. We got me. If you, got, if you guys do get the chance, feel free to post. Obviously, if you don't want to, don't feel the need to. Um, this way, it'll keep it much more collaborative as we as we start to go. We'll give it about one to two more minutes here, so that way we're letting everybody straggle in. And then as we get going, I'll mention this when the actual presentation starts. Um, but if anybody is experiencing any technical difficulties, I know there's a million chats or a million different screen sharing or webinar software out here. Um, so let us know and Addie will be there to help you out. I, I am not seeing the question, anything in the questions tab here, Addy. So I might need your assistance when questions and comments come through. But no problem, Alfred. Perfect. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything on my end. But that's why we're doing these webinars. We're learning from them, and then we'll start doing these regular webinars monthly. All right, so seems like we've given everybody a few minutes. Uh, we might have some people straggling in. Uh, again, I apologize, but I'm not seeing anything come through the chat or questions. So Addy, I'll, I'll need your assistance with that uh, throughout the webinar. But uh, go ahead and message me on Slack or something like that. Um, again, appreciate everybody joining. Uh, we've gotten requests to start doing these webinars and assist with our the human connection that I always tell our, our users we try to add to the software space. Uh, you guys can start to meet some of our engineers who work hard on these calculators and features for you guys and take all the requests that you guys have and you know we're working on them for you. Um, as you guys see in our slides today, we're gonna focus on load and tributary width, a uh, specific to the theory, but also and how to apply that into clear calcs. Uh, Laurent will go through a short overview and some examples. The way we're looking to set these webinars up is about a 30 minute presentation that today Laurent will help us with, and then about a 20 to 30 minute Q&A, so that way we can uh, have a more collaborative process and answer the questions that you guys have specific to load and tributary width. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, say hello and ask your questions in the box, um, and we will answer them once we get to the Q&A section. So, Laurent, if you don't mind, uh, bump over to that next slide. There we go. Oh. <laughs> All right, so basically the same thing here. 
uh, you got me, and this will be on a, another slide, but I'm our director of customer success, so then I'll uh, introduce the next two. <laughs> Most of you guys have an idea of what Clear Calcs is. Um, we've got Addy, who is our growth marketer, and Laurent, who's our North American structural lead. Uh, Clear Calcs, many of you guys are users. Some of you guys have just trialed us in the past. Uh, as you guys know, we are a cloud-based structural engineering software, bring in FEA analysis. We have wood, steel, cold form steel, concrete, beams, columns, footings, trusses, portal frames, retaining walls now, and continuing to add to that uh, with a focus right now on the US, but also expanding our calculators internationally. Um, our idea here at ClearCalcs is to allow you to design more accurately with more confidence Eliminate that wasted time, hopefully using something like our load linking, load path tracking feature that I know some of you guys use quite a bit. And then like I mentioned, we are cloud-based, so we are available anywhere and everywhere you have access to the internet. So next slide here, I will give you, well, what we're talking about today, like I mentioned, is tributary width. And Laurent's going to go over some worked examples for us. Um, hopefully you guys have a base understanding of tributary width, but if not, that's what today is for. Uh, we're going to show you some theory, but also how to actually apply that into clear cups. And then finally, for the third time, I am our director of customer success. <laughs> hopefully uh, making you guys as successful as possible in clear cups. That's my job. So definitely ask me questions if you guys don't already. Uh, Addie, we're very lucky to have her having joined the team in 2022. Uh, she's our growth marketer. And as you see here, helping everyone discover, learn and share the clear calcs way. So be sure, to, be sure to follow us on LinkedIn as well. Addie's been pretty active there. Uh, then Laurent, of course, who most of you have probably had some communication with. Uh, but if you hadn't, he is our North American structural lead, and he's the guy who's leading all of our calculator work here in North America and the U.S. specifically. So, again, appreciate all of you taking the time. And Laurent, I'm going to hand it over to you. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Connor. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. This is pretty exciting. As Connor mentioned, this is kind of our first webinar. So, you know, bear with us if there's any hiccups or something like that. But um, yeah, should be fun. So yeah, thanks a lot for joining us. And then we will be talking today about tributary width. And um, I put this big picture of a river because I actually, I, I thought it was almost funny. Um, when I went to school and we learned about tributary width, tributary areas, all that stuff, I was like, okay, well, that's what it is. And then I found out probably years later that you know, tributaries are actually a term that usually most people refer to as rivers. And I was like, oh, I'm kind of dumb. I wish I knew that before. So there we go. So this is a river and it actually works out to be a pretty good analogy for how tributary width works in engineering. So we've got a river here. I think this is somewhere in South Carolina. Um, if somebody recognizes that, post in the questions. I'll be really impressed. Uh, so go for that. But um, Basically, I wanted to give this as an example of the general principle of what we're talking about with tributary width. So let's start here. We've got a tiny little creek right here. I put an arrow over it. And this tiny little creek, you know, it's taking in water from this area around it. And it's going into this bigger creek right here. So this water is going in here. And this bigger creek is also taken in from other little creeks, right? So it's taking in more water. It's getting bigger. And then that one's going into this bigger creek. I don't even know if it's called a creek at that point, but that one's taking in water from another big creek here. It's taking in. So all of this water is just kind of stacking up, adding up more and more. And then it all goes into the main river here, this big river. So as you kind of go down the river, there's more and more water. It gets bigger and bigger. Very similar to how we'd have, say, a structure. Now, I picked just a pergola here because they're very convenient to show the different parts of a structure here, especially a wooden structure, but they're all basically um, the same. So looking at it here, kind of following our analogy, let's, instead of water, we'll be talking about loads, right? So we've got, say, the weight of this uh, ceiling 
say you're in you know the northern parts of the US, you probably have some snow on there or something like that. So first of all, it's gonna go through these little lats here and go to the rafters. So that's our little creek. And then going into our rafter, the load kind of keeps going. This raft is taking in all of these little lats. So kind of like, again, small creek to the bigger creek. That goes to a beam, bigger creek, which then goes to a column, even bigger creek or a big uh, river or something like that. So same principle, right? Instead of water, we're just talking about weight or pounds. Um, and as we can see, as we kind of go down the path, just by instinct, these members are getting bigger, right? Our lats are tiny half inch thick pieces of wood. Then we get to the rafter, that's a two by. And then we've got here, that's like a three by something. And then our four by something post, right? So kind of instinctively, the more load, the more water you have, the bigger your, your, your structure needs to be. Um, then when we kind of put this more into a visual aspect, let's look at this rafter here. We can actually quantify how much load or you know water it's taking in and that's what the tributary width is so we know that it's taking about half the load from these uh uh lats right all the way down so we know that it's taking basically all this load and that's the tributary width so it's the the width of the roof that's covered or that's held up by this rafter now we can keep going if we look at this big beam here we can see it's taking up a lot more load right so it's taking up basically this half of the roof itself plus this little overhang that's again the tributary width it makes sense that it's bigger right because we're taking more load or going back to that analogy more water so then we can look at that column interestingly that one's actually kind of smaller right it's only taking that little square around the column of the roof taking that load there bring it to the ground Obviously, it's a column, it works a little differently than beams, so the analogy is not perfect here, but I think you get the idea here that, that each member has its own area that it takes. So just to kind of go over it again, tributary width, all it does is it's basically a very convenient way for us to look at how load gets distributed to members. If I go back again to this one at the rafter, the width here, let's say these are 16 inches on center, our tributary width we know is gonna be 16 inches, right? Because it's taken half of each side and it's taken that load. So that's all it is. It's just a very convenient way that we can express and say, hey, this rafter is taking 16 inches of load. Um, this beam is taking six feet. And then this column is taking a, you know, eight foot by eight foot square or something like that. that that's all it is. But we'll see it comes in really convenient when we come to do our analysis. So I'm actually going to jump right into examples now. Um, I came up with this, you know, little very small floor. It's a 11 foot by 12 foot section of floor. Um, but you know, I played around and I decided, okay, let's make it so that we get a bunch of different cases of analyzing tributary width. So the biggest thing here, we've got four different cases, you know, the joists, different beams, um, so with overhangs, et cetera. Um, I, we put in, you know, 10 pounds per square foot dead load, 40 pounds per square foot live load, pretty typical. And we'll be using number one, Douglas fir, dimensional lumber. And what we're gonna do now is, we're not necessarily gonna design all of these beams, but we are going to look at how we put each of these tributary widths into clear calcs and how we can calculate them just kind of visually as well. So let's start with the easiest one, a joist, right? So typically I, I imagine most of you on this call have designed a joist before at some point. So I'm not gonna go over how that's done. Um, first thing when we look at this, I think most of you will know, you know, we typically don't have, we wouldn't necessarily have a smaller joist for these shorter members just because it's, it's not really economical. So we'll just pick the worst case, the longest span uh, with the most load, and then we're gonna design that joist, right? And so for a joist, um, easy enough, our tributary width, like we showed in the picture, is basically just the spacing, right? We're taking half of the spacing here, half of the spacing here. If these joists are at 24 inch spacing, that means we've got 12 inch on each side, you know, one foot, one foot. And so we can calculate just briefly and quickly, 
20 pounds per linear foot dead load, 80 pounds per linear foot live load. So now let's go into clear calcs and put that in there. Let's see how that works. So I'm going to switch here. I am going to create a floor joist. And we're just gonna let that load. Perfect. And so I imagine most of you have been in clear calcs at this point. You're probably familiar with this view a little bit. Um, so we're going to scroll down now to the loading section, since that's where we're going to care about loads and how tributary widths are entered. So the first thing we're going to look at here, I mentioned spacing is all based on, uh, sorry, the tributary width for, for joists is all based on spacing. So because we know that's the case for joists, we kind of made it convenient here. You can just directly enter the spacing and we'll calculate the tributary width for you. So if I come here, you'll see this project default formula. All that means is if you go in your project defaults here on the left, you can actually change the joist spacing for your entire project. And then when you create other joist sheets, you will be able to, it'll automatically have that same spacing. In this case, since we're just doing an example, I'm just gonna erase all this and just type in 24 inches, since that's what we had in our example. And you can see here in our distributed loads, we've automatically updated our start tributary width and our end tributary width, which I'll go over in a few minutes, to two feet, right? Which is exactly what we'd expect. And that's it. We've basically entered a tributary width. If we look at our diagram here, we can see load width, two feet, Dead load, 10 PSF, live load, 40 PSF. Look on the right here, we see 20 pounds per linear foot dead load, 80 pounds per linear foot live load. And then we've got the self-weight as well. We don't really care about that right now, but the only thing we care about is the 20 and 80, which if we go back to our presentation here, matches with what we had expected. So it's a pretty simple, simple case. Obviously it's a joist, it's not that hard, but I figured let's start with something easy. Now let's move on to our beam now. So let's take the easiest one. It's a short beam. Everything is nice and straight. Let's look at that. So we actually have two options here. So we could look at, you know, every joist framing into this beam as an individual point load and just model these point loads. That's not too bad. Obviously, in this case, we only have uh, two to four joists framing into this beam. So it's probably doable. Um, Obviously, if you've got a longer beam where you might have 10, 20 joists framing into it, that's not a very viable option. So that's where tributary width becomes really useful. So we're looking at here, instead of framing in, or uh, look at all these joists as point loads, we can actually just apply these as distributed load. So we just take this whole concept of tributary width again. We say, hey, this beam is taking all the load for this area. And that's it, right? We've got our tributary width, four foot, four and a half feet, basically, knowing that this fan is nine feet, it's taken half. So easy. So we can do that again, the calculation by hand, 10 pounds per square foot times four and a half feet, 45, and then live load 180 pounds per linear foot. Um, let's put that in clear calcs now. So again, should be a pretty simple one. I'm going to create now a would be ASD, but let's do a floor girder this time. So we'll let that load really quickly. And so you'll notice we have these different kind of preset values for different components. So these are based basically on our experience, what our users have found are the most useful. So feel free to explore them, and especially we've got the, the rafter and, and uh, hip and valley calculators that actually have some pretty advanced calculations in them that will make your life easier, hopefully. So anyways, I'm gonna go back here and I am going to scroll here. And now I have my floor load, 10 pounds per square feet, uh, 40 pounds per square feet. The only thing I need to change is my tributary width. So I'm gonna look at this total start tributary width. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit here. I've got it at seven feet right now. Now let's go back to the presentation and let's look. We've got four and a half feet. So the only thing I have to do here is type in 4.5 and you'll see four feet plus six inches. And you'll see the end trip width automatically updated to match it. And you can see it's because it's matching to the start trip width. Most of the time, 
these will stay the same. And we'll go over a case where these don't stay the same soon. Um, but for now, we only care about the start tributary width. We put four and a half feet, and then we can see 45 pounds per linear feet, 180 pounds per linear feet. If we go back to our presentation, 45, 180. So perfect, we're matching. And then obviously we can go back now, we can change our length, we can design our size and grade, et cetera, based on these findings. Uh, we do have some one page examples on our website that kind of go over this process. In this case, we're really focusing on um, the tributary width, so I, I'll skip that part for now, but it is something that, that we can do, absolutely. So let's go back now to our presentation. One thing that I wanted to note here is that it is conservative to use tributary width. Um, sometimes we might feel like, hey, it's more realistic if we model the point loads from the joists or something like that. Um, there's no doubt about it, obviously, those joists are point loads in the real world. And so it is kind of more realistic to model the joists as point loads. However, like I said earlier, adding 10 or 20 point loads on every beam isn't a very realistic or efficient use of your time. So that's where the tributary width comes in useful. And just to kind of show you, if I put in, you know, thousand pounds at every, at a quarter points on a beam like this, versus if I apply the same load, but as a uniformly distributed load, and I look at the bending moment, so the bending strength of the beam, in red, I've got what I get from the uniformly distributed load, so the bottom case, and then in blue, from if I model it as point load. So you can see my peak moment here is exactly the same, right? It's 5,000 for both cases, and then outside of that, my uniform load actually is, is has a higher moment, which means it's it's you're designing for a higher force basically. So you're always safe kind of considering it that way. It's, it's always going to be either equal or more conservative to consider uh, the uniformly distributed load using a tributary width compared to modeling all your joists framing in individually. Uh, so I wanted to bring that up so you can feel a little reassured that it is a, you know, a safe option to design. Uh, oh, I see someone just asked if it is still conservative for a shear. Michael, thank you very much for asking that. Um, you know what? I probably should have put the graph in there. Um, the, the short answer is yes, it is conservative for shear. The, the peak shear that you'll see in your beam always will be either equal or safer. The one caveat I will say, and it doesn't really matter too much for wood, but for say concrete beams, it does come into effect. Um, your shear at the middle of your beam will be lower with if you model it as a uniform load with the tributary width versus a point load. So that that is the one case where things will be a little different. For wood, you know, you're not adding stirrups or reinforcement for shear anyways. So you mostly just care about your peak shear anyways. In which case, yes, this is a conservative um, way to proceed. Uh, perfect. Thanks a lot for that, Michael. So I'm going to go back into our example now. And now we're going to look at a bit of a trickier case. We're going to look at a skewed beam. So we looked at the straight one earlier. Now let's look at the skewed one right next to it. Now, obviously, we don't have nice straight lines everywhere anymore. It looks a little scarier, but really it's not that bad. Um, so the first thing, obviously, because we have a skewed beam, we'll have to calculate our length, right? So six squared is the Pythagorean theorem. We find our length, that's not really a problem. Now let's look at how we're gonna look at our tributary width. So basically we're gonna base, follow just the same principle. We're taking our tributary width at the mid span of our joist. So if I look at the joist at this end, we know it's four and a half feet, right? We just did this on this side. So we know it's four and a half feet. Now let's look at the other end. Um, I've got nine feet minus four feet. So this is five feet here and half is two and a half feet. So two foot six inches. That's my tributary width at this end. So now we have a, we call you know, a varying tributary width. That gets a little tricky to analyze by hand because now you've got, you know, a trapezoidal load and you can't just go into a textbook and find your answer for your beam or your, your capacity just like that anymore. 
luckily, there's you know nice software like ClearCalx that's going to help us look at that. Um, but for now, let's just look at our load. So again, if we look at the left end here, it'll be the same as what we had on our previous beam. So 45 dead load, 180 pounds per linear foot live load. And then our right end, it's basically 10 pounds per square foot times two and a half feet, so 25 and 100 pounds per linear foot. Um, so let's go to clear calcs and see how we can put that in clear calcs now. So switching here, let's create a new floor girder. Okay, so in this case, we'll just set the length because we bothered to calculate it earlier. We'll just let everything load. So I'm not sure if you, Connor has probably shown this to a few of you in demos before, but we actually let you use formulas in these input cells. So let's just do um, calculate our length automatically. So I'm, I can just type in square root six squared plus four squared. And boom, I've got my length automatically calculated for me. Um, and now I can go and look at here, 7.21 feet, 7.21 feet. So right on, that's pretty convenient if something changes or you know you don't have to bust out the calculator to, to calculate this now. So going on now, let us scroll to the loads. So this is where it gets interesting. Again, we've got our floor load, start and location, no problem. It's, zero to the end of our beam basically. Now this is where it gets interesting. This is where our start and our end tributary width are not gonna be the same. So let's start with our start tributary width. We go back, we know we've got four and a half feet on one end and two and a half feet on the other end. So we can type in 4.5. And now obviously this automatically updated. We can just change this now to 2.5. And let's see what happens. You can see now we've got our trapezoidal load and it also shows up here. And we can see the dead 45, 180 on one side and then 25, 100 on the other side. And that's it. Clear calculus will automatically kind of calculate, you know, your, your bending moment, your shear, your deflection, all based on this trapezoidal load for you. And you can see, you can make sure that it's actually being applied. Um, there you go. And so, Going back, we can see, you know, 45, 180, 25, 100. If I look here, we had calculated 45, 180, 25, 100. So everything matches, we're happy. Um, so uh, I think there might be a question here. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, the tributary width method is unconservative for girder support and joist at the cantilever end. Yes, uh, Joel, thank you for bringing that up. So. That's actually a really good point. Um, I'm going over a, a, you know, a really simplified design here. Um, Joel, you're bringing up a really good point that once we start having overhangs or continuous beams, the tributary width method can underestimate loads in those cases. And that, that's something that's actually really important to bring up. Um, for instance, I think if you've got a, you know, a two-span continuous beam, the load on the middle uh, support is going to be, I think, one eighth higher than if you were just using the mids fans. Um, now, just for the sake of simplicity here, um, you'll see we use the mids fans just to, to, to keep things simple, but that is absolutely something that you should be checking um, when looking at tributary width. So thank you, Joel, for bringing that up. That's really appreciated. Um, so yes, as Joel brought up, we're looking at the girder at the bottom now, and um, we just took the mid spans, Joel. Thank you for bringing that up. In reality, um, we might want to look a little bit further and just be on the safe side. Um, there are ways to calculate this. I won't jump into it today. However, um, you know, reach out if you if you'd like to talk more about it. The other thing you can do is obviously you can use our, our load linking and clear calcs, and and you can basically avoid this this whole problem. Um, that's something that maybe we can discuss at the end. Um, but for now, I, I'll just go over this because I think it still shows the principle of, of how we want to apply our, uh, our tributary widths. So looking at this here, we've got our girder here. Now it's got, you know, the half with the, um, whoops, with the, the straight beam here and our skewed beam. So now we've got a load that's straight and then it changes into a trapezoidal load. 
we have to do something about that. So looking at it now, we've got you know two feet overhang here. Obviously, our girder is going to take this load. Then we know we'll have four and a half feet on this side and two and a half feet over here. So we can calculate our left end and our middle loads in PLF. So that's going to be, we do the calculation, 65 PLF um, at this end, and then 45 PLF here for the dead load, and then 260, 180 for the live load. Now, let's go into clear calcs and put that in there. So I'm going to create a other uh, floor girder. And in this time, you'll see, we're not only going to look at tributary width, we're also going to look at um, how our loads start and end. So let's do that. Now, again, we do care about the length in this case. We've got 12 feet. If I go here, you can see six feet, six feet. So 12 feet is actually perfect. Um, so now let's go to our loads. So I know I've got a rectangular load uh, for half my beam. So I can start you know, from zero to six feet. I have a rectangular load like this. My tributary width, let's go back to our presentation. It is four and a half feet plus two feet. So I can type in 4.5 plus two and I've got my six and a half feet. And because it's rectangular, we're good. We want it to stay the same at the other end. Now I can add a other load. So floor load, let's call it trapezoidal. That one's going to go from six, or I can also type just L over two, six to the end of my beam. So just L, which is 12 feet. My start trip width is going to be also 6.5 right because we're at this point here at the middle and then my end trip width however that gets lower right so that's going to be the two feet plus my 2.5 feet so four and a half feet and now i'm going to set my loads so 10 psf 40 psf and now you can see floor load traps so it goes from 6.5 to four and a half feet my tributary width and then you can see um, the 65, 260, 45, 180. And then we can also see on the diagram here, everything lines up. It's doing my trapezoidal load on this side and the, the straight load on the other side. And again, we'll calculate your bending moment, your shear, your reactions, your deflection, all automatically for you. Um, so again, you just basically, in this case, when we've got a weird case where we've got skewed beams on one side and non-skewed beam on the other side, no problem in clear calcs. The thing to remember is that's where the start and end location come in useful. They just basically decide where along you know, the, the X and Y you're located. And then the trib width decides you know, what's the magnitude of my load as I go. So going back to our presentation now, um, there's one thing I wanted to bring up because we do hear that quite a few uh, times from customers. Um, sometimes people will wonder, does it matter which side my tributary width is on or which side the load is on of the beam? You know, if I've got, you know, a two foot overhang on one side and an eight foot uh, span on the other side, do I have to take this into account? And I'm here to tell you that the short answer is not really. Um, and, and obviously this comes with a big asterisk that says, you know, some cases you might want to do that. Um, the biggest thing here is, you know, I think people, when they bring that up, they're a little scared. Okay, well, what if, you know, there's a big party on one side and the other side is empty. That's kind of make some torsion in our, uh, in our main beam here. And obviously we don't like torsion. We don't want to consider that. Um, so we did a lot of research into this actually. Um, and the first thing to say is, is because the way most uh, joists or beams and wood are connected, that ends up being a pretty negligible effect. So if we look at the picture on the right, um, we can see we've got the joist hangers. They're actually supported at the top of the beam. So when the load goes into the beam, it, it's kind of aligned with the middle of the beam. So it, it doesn't tend to want to make it twist. And then the other thing is there's, there is a bit of loose in those connections. So even if the beam did twist a little bit, generally it'll twist and it'll still support the load perfectly fine and so when it twists it kind of eliminates the torsion that that happens in there so in essence we end up not having to worry too much about it and now 
this is where we did a lot of research. We looked at a lot of building codes. We looked at, for instance, the uh, IRC. Uh, they, they, they give you span tables for headers and stuff like that. And we made sure that, you know, back calculating from the values that they give, they're also basically not considering any torsional effect and not looking at, oh, is there one side of the beam that's overloaded or something like that? Um, they're, they're only looking at, you know, what's the total tributary width. And if you look at other software as well that's out there, um, we haven't found any software that, that considers this torsional effect or something like that specifically. There is some software that lets you enter um, your loads, you know, for one side of the beam and then the other side of the beam. But behind the scenes, what we found is that it basically just gets all added up into one big tributary width anyways. Um, so that said, um, because, you know, we know that there are some softwares that do look at each side kind of, or input the loads individually for each side. Um, we know that there may be some code reviewers that will be reviewing your designs who want to see each side. So in clear calcs, there's basically two ways that you can handle this. Um, the first one, and that's what I did in the previous example, is you can type in you know just four feet plus two feet say and that's you know your total tributary width puts in all your loads problem solved easy the other way you can do this is you can enter your start trib width or, or sorry your tributary width for site one you just you know write this label say four feet and then site two write the label site two and then put two feet that way when you print out you know your one page pdf report from clear calcs and you send it to your reviewers, they will clearly see, you know, side one is four feet, side two is two feet. Um, if that's something that they're looking for, that's the way that, I, as far as I know, most of our users have been kind of, of, of giving that information to the reviewers. But behind the scenes, um, like I said, every building code, every software will basically treat it as the same tributary width. Um, so just to kind of conclude here, um, what we went over. So the tributary width, it's a, honestly a really important and it's generally a conservative tool for structural designs. Uh, Joel, you brought a really good point about you do have to be careful once you start having overhangs or continuous beams, and that's a bit of a more of an advanced topic. Um, but in general, it is a, a you know conservative tool and it's used all the time for, for designs. Um, in some cases, things get pretty complicated. So you've got some, you know, skewed beams and you get trapezoidal loads and it's really hard to find deflections or something. That's when software like clear calcs can really come in useful to help you analyze this basically in the blink of an eye instead of going through some crazy hand calculations. Um, so that's something that clear calcs I think is, is really helpful for. Um, and then the last thing is, um, you know, this might be a force of habit for some, but in general, we found that there's really no need to kind of split the tributary width on either side. Um, behind the scenes on every software and every code, um, it, it basically all gets combined in one tributary width. And just looking at the way that beams and houses are framed, it actually kind of works out that it, it, it doesn't really matter much in the end anyways. So with that, I, I'll say thank you all for attending and for, for listening to me. And I hope this was a little useful, especially in how to put these things in clear calcs. And I think we'll open up the floor to some questions now. I know, Connor, if you had anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I, honestly, I was just gonna jump in and start to facilitate the questions. I know. Uh, quite a bit of you, you probably saw my blank stare while uh, Laurent was chatting. I was just sending you guys uh, responses back as many as I could get to. Uh, but yeah, like Laurent said, we can start to answer some of your questions. Uh, and on this webinar software, we can actually unmute some of you uh, so you can ask your question and, and kind of expand upon it to make sure that we're answering your question fully. Uh, so the first one, if Addy, if we can unmute John Cagle on his deflection question. And John, if you feel comfortable chatting, go ahead. If not, uh, I'll have Laurent answer the question that you've sent through the chat. Hey, can you hear me, Connor? Yep. All right, perfect. Hey, first of all, thank you guys so much for putting this on. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to kind of see you guys in person and, and uh, see what your software can do. Um, we just recently been doing some wood beam analysis using clear calcs and uh, 
we're running into looking at this short-term deflection versus long-term deflection. I wonder if you just give a, a brief explanation of the, the key differences between those two. Yeah, absolutely, I'd be happy to do that. Um, let me switch to clear calcs, and I'll just use this example for now. Um, really good question, and this is something that, to be honest, I think that the codes could probably be a bit clearer on. Um, what we're looking at with short-term deflection is essentially only the live load, only the um, snow load, or only the wind load deflection. So not considering the dead load at all. Um, so that would be your typical kind of L over 360 or L over 480 check that you would have for a joist. And then our long-term deflection here, that is basically our live load plus what we call the creep component of the dead load. And what we mean by that is, is this is how the, the kind of the codes handle this. Generally, once you've put in your, your wood beam um, and you're, you're putting your flooring, you're putting your drywall, that kind of dead load deflection is already locked in, if that makes sense. And so what we're looking for specifically is obviously wood with time is going to sag a little bit more. Um, we want to calculate how much of that sag because that, you know, obviously that will lead to some drywall cracking or, or you know, some uh, you know unappealing visuals. So that's what we're looking at in our long-term deflection. And so if we look at the code, that will usually be taken as the full live load plus one half of the dead load deflection. Um, now, if you're using a wood beam in exterior conditions, so where it's, it's gonna be continuously uh, wet, then we're gonna use, the, it, there's gonna be more creep basically so we're going to use just the dead load plus the live load deflection. Um, now that said, we have heard from quite a few users that a lot of uh, review departments or code departments, they like to just see the dead load plus live load deflection, just the total deflection. Um, and while it's not officially required for the code, we get it. You know, that's that's what people like to see. So that's why we've added this delta, you know, DL plus LL, so dead load plus live load. So that's just dead load plus live load deflection. Um, I hope that kind of clears things up. Um, I know it's a bit confusing here, especially because the, the codes don't seem to quite match with what people are necessarily doing always on the ground. Um, so we, we try to kind of strike a balance here, but that's the, the general idea here. All right, fantastic. Thank you for the explanation. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. Yeah, great question, John. And then we did have, sorry, I'm looking at my other screen. I forget who who asked it. Just because this is a very quick question, and Laurent, you're on the page already, uh, and then I want to jump into Jeff Casillo, your questions. Um, Laurent, could you just very quickly show how to change from like pin pin to pin roller or pin fixed or anything like that? Absolutely. So that's very simple. So the way we can do that is here in our uh, pin support. You can just change it to a fixed, a roller. Um, if you've got a hinge, pretty rare in a wood beam, but if, if you maybe if you're dealing with steel, you might have a hinge or something like that on your beam. And you can also add braces here. So um, if you've got, say, uh, another beam framing in somewhere and you can use that as a brace against your, your, your beam buckling, a lateral brace, you can add these directly um, in here as well. So if I switch this to, say, a fixed support, You'll see, obviously, my moment diagram changes a lot, um, and you can see it. It's kind of hidden here, but there is a, a little fixed support icon. Here. I hope that that clears things up. Yeah, and then just to point out, just to close that one out, you can see it as well on the reaction diagrams on the, the right-hand side of your page pretty clearly. That's that right. <laughs> um, and then, Jeff, uh, you had a question regarding the the hangers and wood members in the US. I know you and I have chatted in the past regarding uh, connections coming into the US eventually here in clear calcs. Uh, if we want to unmute, unmute Jeff Castillo and get a specific question on how hangers would play into the tributary with of the the bearing length. It looks like Jeff you probably can uh, do a better job of I can than I can on asking that question to Laurent. Connor, uh, Jeff just said that he doesn't have a mic on hand. Okay. Uh, so, Laurent, did you get that question through my uh, 
through yes. attempt at Let's saying see, uh, Apologies here, guys, but I'm just going to pull this up. Um, so it's number uh, three and then number five on this document that you, me, and Addy have going. Okay. Through. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. So actually, I think there's a picture in here. Here. So on the picture on the right, we can see um, there's some, some, you know, some joists supported by a hanger. Uh, so first of all, uh, Jeff, thank you for bringing that up adding hangers in design and basically checking against maybe Simpson databases to make sure you're using the right hanger to make it faster. That is 100% something that we want to do. We know it's a big part of your work to, to basically just go through all these pages in the catalog and find the hanger that matches or the connector that matches. So I think that this is a perfect job for a computer to kind of help out or at least you know give you some suggestions about what you can do here. So absolutely, that is something that we're, uh, we're gonna be doing pretty shortly, I expect. Um, now, in terms of how that affects the bearing length, that is typically something that I think you'll find in the Simpson catalog. Um, your bearing length, obviously, it depends how it's connected. Um, if you've got some hangers that are just nailed on the side, then the bearing doesn't really matter too much, obviously. And in that case, just going back into clear calcs, this is where you can set your bearing length to just zero. And then we're just not going to run a bearing check on that. So basically, if, if you're using a hanger and they're, they're you know, the manufacturer is telling you don't need to check for bearing, we've already done the tests, then you can just put zero and we're just not going to check bearing. So that, that's the easy way to deal with that. The other way is obviously you, you're going to just want to take a look at your, your hanger and the manufacturer should provide some direction as to what is the bearing length to use in that design. Um, so yeah, Jeff, I hope, I hope that answers your question. Um, we're pretty excited actually to bring in the hangers in tier calcs. I think it's gonna be a pretty cool feature uh, that hopefully should save you a lot of time. Um, and then in terms of bearing length, like I said, the, the easiest way, if, if you know that you're fine, just switch the bearing length to zero and then we're just not gonna check it. If you want to check it, then, then you, unfortunately I think the best thing to do is to look at what the manufacturer suggests for now. All right, thanks, Laurent. Uh, and then, Jeff, I, I just saw your message to me. You'll, you'll send through an email. Uh, that's perfect. And thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve mentioned that adding the Simpson hangers would be wonderful. Uh, awesome. Yes, we are definitely working on doing that because, like Laurent said, that we've we've heard that request quite a bit, and we know it'll help in your guys' uh, workflow. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm not uh, ignoring you guys. I'm looking at my other screen here, looking at these questions. Um, trying to find the next one that I think will apply to a lot of people. Um, I did see one about um, a cheat sheet for the formulas. Like we entered uh, the square root in here. Um, I don't know, square root of three or something. I don't know. Um, the, the short answer here is whatever you can use in Excel, odds are you can probably use it in tier calcs as well. Uh, maybe not like the VLOOKUP and all that cool stuff, but uh, that's the general idea of it. I really like the idea of a cheat sheet though. Um, I'm going to talk to our team about what we can do here. Uh, I totally get it. There's a lot of really cool stuff you can do. Um, one advice maybe I can give right now is every single um, number that you see here, if you go and click on the description, so say the total, total material length, um, there's this formula reference. So in this case, it's just L. You can use that in any formula and you will be able to, to use it. So say N plies, um, if I click on this, the formula reference is N underscore COM. So I'm just gonna make this up, but I could type in N underscore COM times four, and it'll you know it'll do three times four equals to 12. so you can do this with literally every single number in clear calcs so you can get pretty creative with some formulas if you want uh, about how you do this yeah great point there laurent and that can also be uh, a lot of people take advantage of that using their project defaults as well that way if something changes uh, later on in your design process just change it once in project defaults and it'll upload or update the rest of your files to hopefully save you the headache at the end of a project. Uh, Laurent, I've got a question here from Nathan Lee, who this is a good one, and I think uh, a bunch of other people might have this as well. 
does ClearCalc consider the live load reductions based on how much tributary area there is? That's a really good question. Um, the short answer is no, not right now. We don't consider the live load reduction. The reason for that, I will say, is most of the projects that I think our, our users are doing right now have been small enough that, that the live load reduction isn't all that valuable in the end. Um, however, I think you know we're building up our calculations. They're becoming you know applicable to more and more bigger projects. So yes, that is something that we want to do. Um, Nathan, I, I honestly, I, I might reach out to you after this. I'd be very curious to hear about how you're using it in your practice um, and, and you know what kind of members. I'm going to guess usually it's with columns. Uh, that is something we'll implement, um, but uh, maybe a bit more on the longer term on that one. All right, great question there, Nathan. Uh, I had one up just now that uh, Dale asked a question here, Dale Benjamin of Classic Design Group uh, in Oregon. Uh, he said he can basically, he's asking for us to confirm here, I can basically ignore the tributary width after the first joist when using the load link tool. So essentially, if you're, and maybe we can unmute Dale here, Addy, uh, as long as he has a mic. But what I'm thinking here is as long as he has his tributary width on his joist, and then he links it maybe to a girder or downstream, uh, we're automatically picking that up as the line load. Yes, yes. So that was my, yes, exactly. On the awesome. line loads, yep. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good point. Um, so what we can do now, and this only works with joists and rafters specifically. So you'll notice here, there is no option for a spacing on these beams. If I go to my joist calculation now, um, just gonna take a second, you'll see I can enter my center to center spacing, so 24 inches in this case for my joist. Now, if I go back to my beam, and I, again, it's going to take a second, apologies there. I can go here and do a line load and hit the link button. And you will see the B1 and now 0, 14 feet. So let's just pick 0. And now I can say from where to where. So I'm going to type in from 0 to L. And you will see now. I've got my joist length in. And if you remember, I've got 81.2 pounds per linear foot, 280 pounds per linear foot. So these are my reactions from my joist that are automatically being converted into a tributary area that can be applied to our beam. So if I go back to the presentation um, here, we're basically doing the calculation for you about the tributary width. So once you put in your joist, that's right, you can just use the load linking feature and we'll take care of everything um, for you. And that actually, that, that brings me back to what Joel brought up about uh, continuous beams or overhanging beams where the tributary width, kind of the, call it the, the, the dumb tributary width method doesn't necessarily account for those effects. When you do the linking in clear calcs of your joists, we will take that effect into account. So you can reliably use uh, that load linking way to use the tributary width. Thanks, Dale. Yeah, great question, Dale. Uh, probably got, it looks like we have about seven more minutes, so potentially time for uh, one or two more. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I forget who mentioned it, but basically uh, when you were going over the side one versus side two, yeah. Uh, he mentioned he typically specifies face mounted hangers. Uh, so using your explanation, does that mean he should, uh, in clear calc start to do top flange hangers or does that not necessarily have an effect on it? So, okay. I, I will preface this and, you know, obviously we, we can't give you official engineering advice or anything here. Um, take everything I say with a grain of salt and, um, you know, you, you have to use your own judgment, obviously. Um, that being said, what we found in our research is that most engineers, most building codes, most software would still consider that um, kind of all at the same. They wouldn't consider the, the side one or side two. Uh, they would basically treat it all the same. And basically, like 
you know, yes, we all know that if you've got something on the side, it's going to make your beam want to twist. Uh, I think the general principle is is just it it's negligible kind of compared to the, the overall effects of the the load. If that makes sense. All right. Um, and then just a final uh, kind of take on a few of these questions at once. Uh, so we have Richard Bowman who has asked, just while we're on the subject of features, uh, where we might be at and if we are adding a shear wall calculator for the US and Laurent, if you're okay with it while you're answering that, if you could just pull up our support page, because we also got a question about uh, hip valley rafters and I think it'd be a great idea just to show how to access our one page worked examples while you're responding Absolutely. to the question. Okay, so the short answer is yes, we do have shear walls coming up. Um, if you have anything that you would like to see in a shear wall calculator, uh, send us an email and I'll show you how to do that in a second, but absolutely send us an email. Um, we're literally working on it right now. So now is the best time to send the stuff. We're going to be adding it in there. We want it to be useful for you guys. We want it to be you know, efficient so that you can quickly design things. So please send it to us and we'll, we'll do our best here. But the good news is yes, that's coming up um, very soon. Uh, and then in terms of accessing our support, there's a big help button here at the bottom. If you click on this, it's going to open this. So this will give you a bunch of answers. You can type some. So if I've got an answer, a question about um, building codes, let's see what comes up. Uh, if I type this in, building codes and load combinations in the United States. And that'll, that'll take you to... Uh, you know, a nice article that we've got about how we implement these. This is a little compact, but if you type it, it'll actually open it on our website, and then you can read about this. Um, then we're talking about different states. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can click the Ask button up here, and then type a email. And this, we are really good about this, I think. It's one of our, our, our kind of our proudest things. We really, really care about customer service. Um, so when you send this, it will send an email to every single person on our team and we will we basically have someone the cool thing with being a kind of an australian and american company at the same time is when we're sleeping in north america the australians are working and vice versa so we can basically you off, offer you support 24 hours a day um and so so it's kind of a thing that, that we all like doing we like getting questions we like being able to help you it's really fun you know personally we get some really good questions and it's had me you know, go down some rabbit holes of research and, and find out about, okay, how does this actually work? And it, it, it's, it's really fun. So yeah, keep them coming. Um, we'll be more than happy to, to help with this. And then just lastly, just this last minute here, Laurent, if you could just go into our support page and just show them that uh, if anybody isn't aware of this, uh, we do have fully worked like one page examples. Uh, we have how to articles. Uh, so let's do this. So once you're on this website, honestly, it's it's really convenient. You can I've got it added to my bookmarks. Um, it's pretty useful. Um, so in this case, you know, we've got videos about um, making different examples. We've got some that are you know side by side, working the example by hand, working in clear calc. Um, I highly recommend you look at them. These are made by a, you know, a really qualified people who, who know their stuff. Um, we've got a full webinar here on wood design. Um, and then that goes for, you know, everything. So if you look here, we've got a deck design series. So we'll go through every single component of a deck, um, how to put things together, um, you know, down to the foundations, um, how to do it in clear calcs. And so there's a lot of good stuff in there. Highly recommend you take a look. Um, if you have any questions, happy to help as well, anytime. All right, appreciate it, Laurent. I always like to make sure to point that out because there's some good stuff on there and Laurent mentioned somebody every day is dedicated to responding to everybody's help emails when they aren't actively responding to an email we're creating extra help content here to to hopefully help uh take on any questions you guys might have or explain any theories uh but at this time we're about done with our first webinar i guess uh we used to do webinars a few years back but our first uh in recent history and we're very excited to start doing these uh, much more frequently. Uh, 
So Laurent and I might stay in here and, and answer a few more questions just for a couple more minutes. If you guys need to go, by all means, head out. We'll probably just about five more minutes. Uh, and then just look, like I mentioned, check us out on LinkedIn. Uh, keep us on your, your email so you get our watch new emails and upcoming webinars. And as always, send through not only questions, but suggestions on upcoming features and maybe things that we could focus on for future webinars so that we can uh, help you guys be successful, which helps us be successful. Um, yeah, so I appreciate it, guys. Like I said, Laurent and I will hang out just for a few more minutes here, but thank you guys again. Thank you all. It's been great. then send through any additional questions that you guys might have in the, the chat that I'm I'm seeing now. I'm just gonna blindly talk or blabber on uh, until I see another question. Jeff Castillo, I know uh, I sent you a, a message that will respond to some of your questions uh, after this. Laurent and I will uh, Randy has a question that not necessarily related to tributary widths, but just wondering when logs are going to be included in our uh, member database, uh, more of a, a, a section request. Oh, interesting. So I'm, I'm going to guess like logs for, say, a, a polls or a, a log house. Um, that's an interesting one. We've heard about this before. Uh, I'll be completely honest. Um, going through it, uh, it's a little less kind of surrounded by the standards which makes it a little harder for us to implement um officially that said uh it, it's certainly something that we're always looking into um we're always excited to take on new challenges so uh my you know very generic answer unfortunately it's just going to be a, it's coming up at some point it's really hard to give a timeline unfortunately All right, so logs to be coming soon. And then the rest of you, appreciate all you guys uh, sending through your thanks. We really appreciate it. We were really excited to do this today. Laurent's been prepping for the past few weeks. <laughs> um, Want to make sure I'm not missing anything else. Uh, Randy, Randy, I'll I'll send you an email outside of this webinar regarding the logs uh, and just the different grading agencies and and species and all that that we yeah. have. Uh, just because I think that's a it's a great question, but very specific. So we'll we'll handle that uh, just outside the chat. Appreciate you sending those through, though, Randy. All right, and, uh, I, can, uh, I can just flip this around really quickly. If you guys have any advice for us uh, newbies at webinars, send them in. You know, we'll, we'll gladly, gladly uh, listen to your feedback here, and hopefully the next one's a lot better and more informative. So, yeah, please, please send us your feedback. All right, and you guys could send that feedback to me or to our help at clearcalcs.com. But I think at this point, Laurent and I are going to jump off and go. Laurent's going to start working on some more features for you guys and improving what we already have. And I'm going to help make you guys successful. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, have a great Wednesday and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks again. Thank you, guys. Thank you.